topic is read the Bible for a change. Now, there's some of you, like me in high school, that say, oh, great, another preacher telling me what to do, guilting me into reading the Bible. But I think also there are people here that say, I need a change. Our church needs a change. My family needs a change. Our country needs a change. This world needs a change. And I need to read the Bible to find these answers. You know, the, the series we're, we're in the middle of is called Soul Care, which I thought would make a really great R&B song title. But we think about it, well, we take care of ourselves physically, we take care of ourselves emotionally, we take care of ourselves financially, spiritually. We need to take care of ourselves as well. And with the topic, reading the Bible for a change, I thought, that's where you go. And let me ask here, you can just shout out answers. In terms of taking care of your soul, how does reading the Bible benefit you? Anybody? Gives me strength. Awesome, awesome. Gives me strength. What else? How does reading the Bible soothe and benefit your soul? Direction. Which way to go? What do I do? There it is. That's so awesome. Lifts me out of the mire. The challenges that weigh me down from the world, this lifts me back up. Kurt? It refreshes me so I can look at it better. Ah, we get refreshed so we can pass that along. Anything else? This side's really spiritual over here. So I don't know if you guys got <laughs> Yes, just remembering. Sometimes we need to see Jesus' face so that we can remember that. And, you know, Tim Summerlin, about six months ago, I, we were at Starbucks, and he, said, he told me something. He said, you know, Dave, I love sermons just about Jesus. He said, if we did nothing else for the next five years, just preach sermons about Jesus, I'd be okay with that. And I got one about Jesus. So, Tim, this is for you. I think they can pipe these messages into heaven. So, Tim, this one's for you. Please open your Bible to Luke chapter 4. You know, right now, my, uh, my twins are in Philadelphia in a youth corps. And my wife is in that room over there uh, with the kingdom kids. And, and my son Jake is somewhere around here. He just entered the campus ministry. There he is. So it's been a wild and wonderful summer so far. So i uh, excited to be here. Luke chapter 4. We're going to talk about the Bible. Now, here's the thing. Like everybody said, the Bible's there it brings us comfort, it brings us direction, it picks us up, it reminds us who Jesus is. And even Jesus would spend hours, maybe days, off just connecting with God. But having said that, real change can't stop there. Yes, we want to listen, yes, we want to uh, listen to podcasts, we want to show up to events and church. But there is another step where we put it into action, where we apply what we've learned. You know, buying a gym membership and getting some fancy workout clothes will not get you in shape until you do something. Even Jesus' brother, James, said, do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Church, do what it says. Napoleon Bonaparte said, there is a time for thinking. But after that, stop thinking and go in. That's where we are. And I want to read a story of where Jesus had to put into practice the things that he'd been learning. So uh, we're going to read here. All right, Luke chapter 4. As Je let's start in verse 1. As Jesus full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness for 40 days, being tempted by the devil. And he ate nothing during those days. And when they were ended, he was hungry. The devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, command this stone to become bread. And Jesus answered him, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone. 
as the devil took him up and showed him all the kingdoms of all the world in a moment of time and said to him, to you I will give all all this authority and their glory for it has been delivered to me and I can give it to whom I will. If you then will worship me, it will all be yours. And Jesus answered him, it is written, you shall worship the God, the Lord your God, and only shall you serve. And he took him to Jerusalem and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, if you You are the Son of God. Throw yourself down from here, for it is written, He will command His angels concerning you to guard you, and on their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against the stone. And Jesus answered him, It is said, You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. And when the devil had ended every temptation, he departed until an opportune time. Now the setting for this story Jesus had just come from his baptism. It was a great day. In fact, he heard with his ears, maybe for the first time, the voice of his dad in heaven. You know what the the message was? This is my son with whom I'm pleased. I love him. It, it, It was a, that's my boy right there. That's my boy. And Jesus was like, this is a great day. My baptism, God spoke to me. And then he was led out into the hot desert for 40 days, no food. You think it's hot out here? It's been over 100 degrees, 40 days, no food. And then Satan shows up. Now, we know this story as the temptation of Jesus. And it always was a little weird to me that... I mean, parents, picture your kid gets baptized, and on that day you say, awesome, I'm going to send you down to a frat party so you can be tempted. Let's see how you do. We probably wouldn't do that. However, that word temptation, tempting, is, oops, I forgot to move those along. Sorry, guys. Uh, The word temptation is perazo. Say it with me, perazo. It means both tempt and test. It's the same word that when the Pharisees would come to Jesus and they would put him to the test on how much you know about the scriptures. And so many times the Bible says, hey, it's the testing of your faith that strengthens you. This is not just, God didn't send Jesus out to be tempted to see if he would sin. But parents, would you be okay allowing your child to be tested, to show their strength, to show where their weak points are, so they know where they are? Yeah, yeah that's, that's something that we, to send our kids out in the world is a scary thing. I'd like to know, are they going to be okay? Has, my, has our upbringing helped them? So that is, uh, Pedrazo is really what uh, Jesus talked about. Now, um, This story really, even though it just feels like a little casual conversation, this is an epic showdown. A lot on the line. If Jesus faltered, the whole mission is over. It's kind of like Harry Potter and Voldemort going toe-to-toe. Or Gandalf and what was the big fiery thing? Uh, Thank you, thank you. I mean, they're going for, for my people, Rocky and Drago. However, what was the weapon of this battle? It wasn't, it wasn't a staff with lightning coming out of it. It wasn't physical strength. It wasn't even intelligence. It was the Word of God. Now, let's pause for a second. That phrase, there, there's people here probably been reading the Bible for decades, maybe your whole life. And there's people here maybe just came in off the streets and are not sure. But when I say the the phrase, word of God, what do you think of? Anybody? Sword. Sword. What else? Bible. Yes. Jesus. This is the word of God. But that's not the whole picture. Because 
you think about the very first phrase of the New Testament, in the beginning was the Word. The Word was there before the universe existed. And when God made the world, and he made this perfect paradise, which was his plan, he would come and walk and talk with Adam and Eve and their family. And they would, that was the Word of God. That was how it was delivered. Well, then things went bad, so God says, I will talk to a few men called prophets, and they'll tell people the word of God. Later on, Moses went up on a mountaintop and was delivered the law. 600-some laws, the word of God. Then something mind-blowing happened, even the angels didn't see. God took the word and put it down encapsulated into a little baby. And he grew up as a man. The Word became flesh. And then his followers, guided by the Holy Spirit, wrote down the same Word, and that's what we have here. Now, there's a question that if you haven't thought it, you will be asked this, and you need to have an answer. And the question is, why do you believe the Bible is the Word of God? And you can't say, because my mom and dad always said so. You can't say, because Jesus said so. A little circular there. What's your answer? And some people may even take it a step further and say, if you prove the Bible's the Word of God, I'll believe it. So prove it to me. Do you have an answer for that? Let me, let me say this, Jake had a, his first college semester of philosophy, and he came to the conclusion from his teacher, we really can't prove much of anything. <laughs> you can't prove to me what you had for lunch yesterday without a shadow of a doubt. You can't prove that you're not dreaming right now, and this is all just the matrix. There's very little we can prove. But what we are good at is collecting evidence and making a decision based on the evidence. So what about you? What do you, what evidence have you collected where you can show somebody, this is why I believe the Bible is the word of God? Pausing from the story, I'm going to give you four reasons why I believe you can come up with your own. These are just scratching the surface but let's just talk about this. The first one, I'll just tell you what the four are. There is internal consistency, fulfilled prophecy, manuscript evidence, and archaeology. Okay? Internal consistency, fulfilled prophecy, manuscript evidence, and archaeology. I'm just touching on those. The first, internal consistency. This is not a book. This is a collection of 66 books. They're written by over 40 different authors, spanning 1,500 years, three different languages, three different continents, all perfectly harmonized. These authors, kings, military generals, fishermen, shepherds, a prime minister, a military general, tax collectors, priests, rabbis, they didn't have the internet. They didn't have access to each other. Yet the story all perfectly harmonizes. We think of Jesus in this story with Satan. He references, he has three different Bible references. All from Deuteronomy. Well, that was kind of something Jesus did a lot. In fact, here are over 50 Old Testament references that Jesus made just in the Gospels. Now, I want you guys to imagine something. I want you to imagine a graph, okay? And along the x-axis is every book in the Bible. And every time one book references another book, there's an arc over there. And when they reference it over here, there's another arc. And over here, there's an arc. What do you think that would look like? These 66 books over 1,500 years, somebody put it together. Ready? Ready? 63,000 internal references 
without an error. Internal consistency. That's pretty awesome. Does this prove the Bible is God's word? No. Is it evidence you ought to consider? Yes. Second one, fulfilled prophecy. There are thousands of places in the Bible where they point ahead, this is going to happen. It could be a kingdom rising up. It could be an army taking over. It could be what one person does. It could be the end of the world. And all of the ones that are not related to far end times have come perfectly true. But let's, let's whittle it down. Let's talk about prophecies about a Messiah, about Jesus. There's over 100 of those. Every single one, a green check mark. Yep, said it was this. Yep, it was this. Said it was this. Yes, it was this. But let's bring it down even further. There's one passage in the Old Testament, Isaiah, the middle of Isaiah 52 to the middle of Isaiah 53, where there's over 12 specific examples where they predict a Messiah. They predict how he'd live, what he would be, what his ministry would be like, how he would die, specifics beyond what they should know. Talking about crucifixion, even though that hadn't been invented for another couple centuries. If every one of those, if you did the odds, and people of course have done the odds, if they just randomly happened, 10 to the 17th power you got a better shot at winning the Powerball than those just happening to happen. Fulfilled prophecy. Does that prove the Bible is the word of God? Nope. Is it evidence worth considering? I think so. Now, the third one, which is manuscript evidence, is interesting because there's a problem with that Isaiah 53. And the critics of Christianity have pounced on it. And here's, the, here's the, the argument. They'll say, we'll give you that those prophecies, man, they match up exactly with what happened in the gospel. However, they said, when's the earliest manuscript that we found? And you know what the earliest dated manuscript? It was 900 A.D. You see where they're going. He said, yes, it matches up, but you wrote the prophecy after the thing happened. Sure, it, it matches up, and we're like, that's a fair argument. But then something happened about 60 years ago. Who can tell me what happened 60 years ago that changed everything? Dead Sea Scrolls. Dead Sea Scrolls. If you've ever wondered what's the big deal about the Dead Sea Scrolls, this is really cool. In uh, the northwest part of the Dead Sea, super dry. So papyrus manuscripts, they, they can last longer than if it's humid. And they found a treasure trove of scriptures. In fact, every book of the Old Testament, save for one, were, were listed there. And what do you know? They found entire copies of the book of Isaiah, all 66 chapters. And they were dated not 700 A.D., but 200 B.C. Like, so the prophecy was written before the thing happened. And what's cool? That book of Isaiah matches almost verbatim the one you have in your hand right now. I've actually seen it with my own eyes when they toured with the Dead Sea Scrolls. They came to Florida. So... Does all these, and, and I'm not going to go through these, but this is kind of a cool thing. If you look at just some of the ancient writers that we believe, we just trust. Julius Caesar, yeah, we all know this. Nobody questions the stories about Julius Caesar, it, tu brute, and all these things. It happened, let's just look at Caesar. It happened in 50 BC. The oldest copy we have talking about Julius Caesar is 900, 950 years. Gap. Anybody question that? I've never heard anybody question that, but there's only 10 copies. Same with Plato, Homer. If you ever read the Iliad and the Odyssey, that's 900 years gap. And there's, okay, that's awesome. There's 643 copies of this. The New Testament. Check this out. It happened between 40 and 100 AD. The earliest copy was 125 
A.D. Only 25, 50 years. How many copies of the New Testament manuscripts do we have? 24,000. The, the New Testament is the most attested ancient work of, of, of literature, bar none. It's not even close. Does this prove that the Bible is the Word of God? Nope. Is it evidence worth considering? And the last one, archaeology. This is so interesting, and I'm only going to touch on this. A few years ago, Newsweek wrote an article, and the article was titled, Is Archaeology Proving the Bible? That was the title of Newsweek. And it listed time after time after time after time where they're finding things that match up exactly with what the Bible says. But it tells a story about some archaeologists that were using the Bible as an Indiana Jones treasure map. And they were trying to find the city of Sodom. You know, the one that was destroyed by fire. But, but it was a myth, as far as people believe, because there was zero evidence of Sodom. So these guys were following and they said, well, according to the Bible, we should dig right there. And they started digging. And you know what they found? Again, this is Newsweek. This is a peer-reviewed reviewed article. They started digging. They found five feet of ash that dates back to about 1600 B.C. And they kept digging. They found a ruined city, and the bricks had a glaze on them. That is something that we can't, they couldn't do for a 1,000 years, that kind of technology. It only happens in intense 3,000-degree temperature heat. And they're like, oh, well, maybe the Bible's right. And the, the takeaway is, if you want to disprove the Bible, stay away from archaeology, because everything points back to it. Is this proof that the Bible's the Word of God? No, but man, there's a big pile of evidence that if you're intellectually honest, you ought to consider. Now, let's go back to our story and start to wrap this up. Because as we saw, Jesus and Satan, Jesus was so good wielding the word of God. I mean, Satan threw something at him. Jesus didn't respond with emotion. He didn't respond with, well, I heard this podcast and the guy was kind of indicating that it's something like this or or he didn't say, you know, somewhere, I can't remember where, I'm not good at memorizing stuff, but, but somewhere it said, Jesus didn't say that, it was instant. How are we? How are we at wielding that same weapon? You know, I, uh, I want to transition into a practical phase, and we're going to wrap up with this, because... I believe, and hopefully you do too, you could be having the best day ever and you step outside and it's your turn to be tested. It's your turn. Whether it's in the news, whether it's in your family, whether it's somebody, your neighbor, somebody walking down the street, and the question is, are you ready? Now, i got to make an admission here. I am, um, oh, you know what? I got one bonus one. Sorry, I forgot about this. The bonus proof for me is my brother, Alex. They just moved. A lot of you know him. When he was 18 years old, he studied the Bible in one day and got baptized that same day. And it's 30 years later. And I know my brother. I knew him his whole life. He is not the same guy. Something happened. A changed life is maybe one of the most powerful evidences for me. And according to Jesus, if you want to do the will of God, you will find out whether God's teaching comes from him or he made it up. So, all those proofs, you come up with your own proofs. You answer the question, why do you believe the Bible is the word of God? Here's my admission, though. I have been a Star Wars fan since I was a little boy. Drive in with my parents, watching this movie, and I fell in love. And like every other little 
seven-year-old boy, I wanted to be this guy. Every Halloween for about 10 years, I dressed up as Luke Skywalker. And that has not wavered, that this love of this, these, this movie. I kind of went underground in college because that didn't help with the ladies. But <laughs> I've always loved Star Wars. But there was a question that I had as a kid. Lightsabers are cool, but why would you want a sword when you could have a laser gun? I mean, yeah, that's, this is neat, but phew, phew, that, that seemed fun. Until Return of the Jedi came out, and we said, oh, you can block lasers. You can't shoot a Jedi. And he blocks it. Only if he's good. Only if he's trained. Only if he knows what to do. Because you pick up a lightsaber, you or me, good chance we're going to cut our leg off. In the hands of a master... It's not just an attack, it's a defense. And then I realized, Jesus is the Jedi Master. (laughs) Do you see how fast he responded, not with an opinion, not with an attack, but with a scripture? He, Satan said, hey, you're hungry, why don't you eat that piece of bread? And Jesus said, Deuteronomy 8, man does not live on bread alone. And Satan says, okay, okay. He says, you know what? I could make you richer and more powerful than anyone ever. You just got to worship me. Deuteronomy 6, do not worship anyone but the Lord your God. And then Satan, he says, oh, I see how it is. And he pulls out his red lightsaber and quotes a scripture and said, oh, well, you know, in in Psalm 91, it says, you could throw yourself down and the angels would catch you. Deuteronomy 6, do not put the Lord your God to the test. Jesus is a Jedi master. Hey. So, okay. Now it's your turn. Because we're going to close out with spiritual Jedi training. And I'm going to ask you questions and see how quickly you can answer, not with an opinion, not with, uh, I think it's in there somewhere, certainly not with emotion. Can you give a scripture? as fast as Jesus did when you're attacked. You guys up for this? Okay, okay. And these are not remote. These are not, you know, obscure passages. These are real-world situations. You ready? I need need to see a hand or yell it out, but again, a scripture. Ready? I can be a Christian without going to church. Go! Go! Anybody? Okay. Give a hand to the Jedi right here. There we go. There we go. Here's two. Do not give up meeting together. Some are in the habit of doing. There's also 1 Corinthians 12. You are the body of Christ. The whole book, 1 Corinthians 12, is we're the body. The nose can't say the ear, I don't need you. The hand, the finger, we all have parts. We need each other. Ready for the next one? Let me hear it. Are you saying that only Christians are going to heaven? Somebody? We got somebody? Go ahead, Tony. Awesome, where is it? Okay, 14. Hey, hey, hey. Tony's a Padawan. That's okay. You're the <laughs> also, Acts 4, salvation is found in no one else. No one under the name of heaven by which we must be saved. Okay. Another? We got time for another? Okay. As long as it feels right, it must be okay. There's a way that... Okay, awesome. Where's the reference? 
Proverbs 14, 12. Give it up for the Jedi. Check out this one. My conscience is clear, but that does not make me innocent. That was Paul that said that. Powerful. Okay, I'm going to wrap it up because this is kind of fun. Did you hear about... Certainly gossip doesn't happen in the kingdom of God. Certainly we don't talk about it. Oh, I got with so-and-so. Don't say anything. And we can say, well, I'm praying for that. Uh, there's a little gossip. Somebody, anybody? When somebody gossips to you, anybody? Okay. Oh, you got one? Oh, hold on. Wait, wait. Someone in the back? That's a, that's a great one. It, can you give me the reference? Okay. That's right. That's right. Okay. Okay. Um, here's two. And there's, there's more than two. That was a good one. A gossip separates close friends, Proverbs 16. A gossip betrays confidence. Right there. Last one. And we got to wrap it up. I feel hopeless, like God abandoned me. People are going to tell you this. Kai. That is fantastic. That's a great one. God is close to the brokenhearted. Kai, if you tell me a reference, I'm going to give this to you. That's okay. That's okay. And Jim? Tim? Okay. Awesome. Awesome. That, I think Mr. Hess is absolutely a Jedi. Here's a few. I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you, not harm you. Isaiah 41. I used to make our kids, we had these little plastic swords with this scripture. Do not fear, I am with you. Now, I, the goal of this was not to put you on the spot or embarrass you. And sometimes, we did this with the teens, I would walk up to somebody and say, all right, stand up. Here we go. Let's see how you are. You've been a Christian 30 years or some of the, their parents? Let's see how you do. And our teen ministry in Philadelphia, they start getting good. They're like, oh, bring it on. I'm a Jedi. So the reason I do this, guys, you will get tested. You will get tested probably today. If not today, this week, this month, this year. And the effectiveness is not whether you think I have an answer. I hear all the time, I'm not very good at memorizing stuff. Respectfully, baloney. <laughs> and here's why I say that. We ride a lot of times with teens in the car, and we turn on the radio, Taylor Swift, Pitbull, Luke Bryan. They know every song, every lyric, everything. I've seen some of the yo pros over here when it's fantasy football season. Mr. Brad Schmidt can name Detroit Lions third string running back and how his stats were over the past five years and how he does after his bye week. We have that capacity. And if you remember the 1980s, I guarantee you had at least 25 phone numbers memorized. <laughs> You probably still have some of those numbers memorized because there was no other choice. We needed to. My encouragement, guys, <coughs> as I close, train. Train. The Word of God, yes, it's good for all those things, peaceful and lifting us up and reminding us who we are, but we are to train. And I'll close with this. If you're interested... I made about 15 Jedi training questions up here. You can come pick them up if you think it would help you. We're going to close out, guys, with a prayer. And one of the th reasons for the prayer, yesterday was a tough day for our nation. It's very challenging things you're probably aware of. I challenge you, respond the way a spiritual Jedi would respond. The temptation for emotion is so strong. The temptation for dividing is so strong. The temptation to view ourselves as a citizen of America, a citizen of a party, citizen of a group is so strong. And that's, I think that's exactly where Satan wants you to tunnel. We are citizens of heaven. We are followers of Jesus. Let's train 
Let's love and let's live this way. Let's pray together. Father, we are grateful for the way the Word of God has impacted our lives in so many different ways. We're grateful that you went through so much just to get this message across time and time and time and time again, even though we're thick-headed sometimes. Father, we pray that we can follow in the footsteps of Jesus and not just live the way he did, but think the way he thought and react the way he reacted. Father, you see what's going on in our world, even in our country. Sometimes it feels like everything's on fire and it's so challenging. What are we to do? Father, we put our trust in you. We look to you. As, as in Joshua 5, in the middle of a battle, a, 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 an angel with a sword drawn shows up. And Joshua says, are you for us? Or are you for our enemy? And he said, neither. I'm the commander of the Lord's army, and I'm on his side. Father, help us through this time not to be passive, but to pray for our leaders, to pray for our country, to pray for unity, to pray for healing, to pray for forgiveness, and to pray that we are closer to you than we are to this world right here. God, we thank you for this time. We thank you for this church. I pray in Jesus' name, amen. amen. Guys, we are dismissed. Thank you.